Hey friends, I'm Dr. Kiki, and I'm here again to read a story from San Francisco. Story from my grandfather's book, Nowhere Except San Francisco, Memoirs of a Resident Tourist. His name was Tro Harper. He worked in San Francisco, owned a bookstore on Powell Street. So he was a bookseller in the city for many decades, and... Um, while he lived in San Francisco, he came across many interesting people. Uh, he also worked at KGO as a reporter for a while. He was a photographer, uh, and he has written a number of, excuse me, <coughs> a little frog in my throat, has written a number of books about San Francisco and the people who used to live there. Today we are reading... A short chapter, my uh, my son has Kung Fu at 3.30, so I need to make sure that he gets to that. So, because I'm starting a little late, no, I'm just going to read a short chapter today. It's a little one. A Refuge from the Fog and Cold During Prohibition years and all through the Depression, an unlicensed oasis known as Joe's Wine Cellar opened up for business along about 12 o'clock every weekend night. Right at the crest of Vallejo Street on Telegraph Hill, it was just over the hill from where I lived. A convenience I shall not quickly forget. Joe's was short on decor, but long on excitement and the joy of the unexpected. Strictly illegal, Joe's place specialized in wine and beer served at about 10 picnic tables with benches on either side. In the middle of each table were two or three platters of salami, Monterey Jack cheese and sourdough bread with knives enough to go around among the customers. Drippy candles anchored in old Chianti bottles graced each table and sputtered in the darkness. Joe charged 50 cents for beer and about the same for a glass of Guinea red wine. The bread, cheese, and salami were on the house. The whole setup was in Joe's garage, a cavern carved into the hill beneath the living quarters. The term ground floor was not inappropriate as there was nothing under your feet but dirt, a factor that helped deaden the noise of the yelling as the celebrants engaged each other in endless games of chug-a-lug, a contest whereby various competitors seek to drink more of anything handy than the next fellow. Usually the, con the contests ended in a draw for the simple reason the drinkers could hold no more. It was bad form to ask any of the customers how they felt the morning after. Like most of his neighbors, Joe was of Italian descent. While he had difficulty with English, he was able to count the house and balance the number of guests with his cash receipts. His speed and accuracy in this regard were remarkable, but then he had had many years practice. The wine served was most likely fermented in some neighbor's basement, as there were a lot of catch-as-catch-can wineries in North Beach, especially on Telegraph Hill. They had blossomed to fill the demand for cheap beverages. Anyway, the gallon jugs that lined the shelf behind what passed for a bar bore no labels and no government gabble about birth defects and other terrors not yet invented to horrify the drinking class. Walking through the streets of North Beach during the time of grape harvest in the fall of the year, the pungent odor of fermenting juice drifted out of almost every garage in any given block. Stores along Columbus Avenue and Broadway had windows full of tubes, presses, corks, bottles, bottle sealers, and other arcane equipment used by amateur enophiles. The whole setup in Joe's garage was elemental, primitive, but nonetheless utilitarian. It existed at a time and place when customers didn't complain about wine, redolent with resin and other unidentifiable effluvia. The tobacco police would have fainted at the doorway. Food and drug administrators plus other representatives of present-day health police would have posted placards predicting early graves for those foolhardy enough to engorge the salami and cheese. Joe's faithful customers would have laughed banged an empty bottle on the table and shouted for another drink, plus another platter of salami oozing fat stuff from every pore. Oddly enough, though, most of the clientele survived rather well. So well, in fact, they were able to pass physicals in a variety of military services and win a war to boot. As a retired doctor said to me the other day, 
The guys I had in my care were so healthy it was frightening. Take two aspirin and see me in the morning worked not only for debauchery, but also for almost all other diseases. Since Joe's didn't open for business until midnight, morning was never far off, so how you would feel the next day never seemed important. With the dawn, the various partygoers staggered into the blaze of the rising sun's rays and hoped there, there, there were no cops around. Once World War II was over, there never was quite the same element of carefree life in San Francisco. Shaken from the hopelessness of the Great Depression by the worldwide destruction and loss of life, Young men who formerly had sought solace in such watering holes as Joe's were now involved in the dreary business of making a living. The government encouraged the assumption of mortgages with GI loans. Wives acquired during the war had produced children and other responsibilities, and all-night frolics faded into the nooks and crannies of memory. Naturally, an emporium devoted to frivolity could not long survive in such an environment, so Joe's, as many another fun house, went out of business. Although I've inquired around, no one seems to know whatever happened to Joe, but there is scarcely a customer alive today who will ever forget him. Or the hangovers. <laughs> so we have a long chapter coming up about Chinatown, the Chinatown of Lily Lum. But since I need to be getting my child prepared for Kung Fu in just about, how long do I have? 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Wait, what was that about debauchery? Yes, John, debauchery. <laughs> it was a short chapter about debauchery. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I can either start and read a couple of pages or just save it for tomorrow and read the whole thing tomorrow. So it's a single story, which is what I think I will do. Today's just going to be a short one, and we'll hop into the longer reading tomorrow. And I'll be more prepared for getting my child into the Kung Fu class <laughs> than I am today. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. I hope you are finding good things to read, good work to do, good things to keep yourself busy. Um, you don't have to be productive. That's fine. It's fine to lie on the floor and stare at the, at the ceiling occasionally, to play with cats, dogs, pets. It's all good. But I'll be back tomorrow, round about 3 p.m., for another reading from my grandfather's book, and I look forward to seeing you then. Hey, thanks, Tortoise Blog. I'm looking, I'm, I'm enjoying reading the book. I'm glad that you stopped by for a few minutes. I'll see you again tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Bye.